Hi guys, Mac here again, and it is about time we did another MacBook Pro review. I haven't done one for ages. So this is one of the 2020 13 inch units. There we go. Now, this is one of the 10th gen i5s. It's a two gigahertz with 16 gig of RAM, and I think 512 gig of SSD, could be wrong on that. Now, uh, there's been a lot of videos already showing what they look like and talking about the new keyboard and all that sort of good stuff, and that, that's fine. But I thought we'd quickly move on rather than look at that stuff. Let's go and have a look at the benchmarks. We'll then look at uh, does it throttle and what the thermal performance is like. Perhaps then we'll do a direct performance test with something else. And then we can have a look at how it performs for things like photo editing, video editing, moving on to virtualization. And also one other thing I want to see what this is like is how well does it run Windows 10 in boot camp? Because obviously, as I mentioned on some of my other videos, my 16 inch, for example, when it's running Windows in boot camp, it's not so great. It struggles for heat fans uh, and its battery life is decimated. So we'll have a look at this. Anyway, let's get stuck right in. Here we are with our brand new MacBook Pro. Let's have a look and see which model we're looking at. There we go. It's a 13 inch 2020 unit, one of the ones with four Thunderbolt 3 ports. It's got a two gigahertz quad core i5, 16 gig of RAM, and I believe half a terabyte of storage. There we go. Now, if you want to know exactly which processor in here, it's this one. It's the 10th generation i5 1038NG7. Now, if we look at this one, you'll see that it's four cores with hyper threading. It has a two gigahertz base frequency and it turbos to 3.8 gigahertz. Now it's quite interesting that it's a 28 watt chip. One of the things I find is that people don't often compare like for like, and I'll show you what I mean. Let's go and have a look at the benchmarks now. Now benchmarks themselves are not particularly interesting, but they do give you a reasonable guidance as to where the machine falls in terms of performance. So as you can see, the single core and the multi-core score in Geekbench 5 for this machine they fare pretty well. It puts it slightly above my 2020 XPS, which is a four core i7, but it is a lower TDP chip in the XPS, which is why we're seeing that performance difference. It's only slightly under the performance that I get from the six core i7 from the 7390 XPS from late 2019. So in terms of benchmarks, it actually benchmarks quite well. Another thing that is quite interesting, several people are wondering whether they should pick up a MacBook Pro or one of the MacBook Airs. So let's go and have a look at this comparison here. So you can see our Geekbench 5 scores for our MacBook Pro, the 13 inch one that we're looking at here. But you can also see the Geekbench scores for the eighth generation CPUs of the 13 inch unit. So if you look at the base unit, which is this one, that's the 1.4 gigahertz i5, so that's the 8th gen processor. You can see that the 10th gen processor is quite significantly more powerful than it. If you then further compare it to the Airs, well, let's look at the top spec Air. That's the one with the i7 chip in there. So you can see that that one has a multi-core score of 2843 compared to the multi-core score on our MacBook 13 of 4422. So there is quite a performance gap between the two units. Mac Rumors has done a great comparison between the different units, so I'll link to that in the description down below. I'll also provide a link for this spreadsheet should you want to go and have a look at the numbers in any more detail. So what about the performance of the SSD? Let's have a look at that. Now, one thing I, I will point out is I am recording the screen and it does seem to impact the write speed slightly while I'm doing that. There we go. You can see that we're averaging around 2.2 to 2.3 gigabytes per second in write speed and around 2 gigabytes per second in read speed. Now, it is a little bit slower than what I get in my 16-inch MacBook Pro. In fact, we can have a look at that here. So in my MacBook Pro, my 16-inch model, which is an i9, I get around 2.6 gigabytes per second write and about 2.5 gigabytes per second read. What I'm not clear on, because I, I've not found any information on, is whether the larger SSDs perform any better, as typically they do. The big question that seems to get thrown around about these machines, well these ones and the MacBook Air, is around throttling. So let's fire up the Intel Power Gadget, there we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to max out the processor cores and the graphics as well using the test menu up here and we can leave it running for a few minutes and see what effect it has on the throttling. 
Here, I've tried to measure the fan noise because there is quite a bit of fan noise at this point. It is roughly about the same as my 16 inch MacBook Pro, as you can see there, about 48 decibels. I've tried to record it at the loudest part of the machine using my phone, so that's what you can see there. Now, what's interesting about these is the fan range. The fan range is from zero right the way up to 6336, which is a lot higher than on my 16 inch MacBook Pro. I did try and record the fan noise, but the way it played back I thought was a little bit misleading and it just seemed a lot louder than it actually is in person, so I haven't included that. In terms of general throttling on the processor, I've not observed it at all. So if we look at the figures here, you'll see that it's averaging at 3.29 gigahertz with a minimum of 3.2 gigahertz. Now we've left it running for a few minutes in this test, but I've done some extended testing, which you'll see part of that in a few minutes, and I've not seen it throttle at all. Temperatures are quite interesting. It quite quickly ramps up to approaching 100 degrees, but then as soon as those fans start to kick in, and certainly once they reach above around 5,500 RPM, going above 6,000, the temperature seems to drop down to around the 87 to 92 degrees mark. Now, benchmarks don't always tell the whole story, so I thought we'd have a look at a real-world workload of converting a video from one format to another. So what we're looking at here is on the left, I'm converting a video in Handbrake, and I'm doing it on the MacBook Pro. And on the right, you'll see exactly the same video with exactly the same configuration in Handbrake. Now, if you have a look at the finish times for both of these videos, you'll see that the MacBook Pro did it in 17 minutes, 46 seconds. The Dell XPS went on to take 34 minutes and 8 seconds, so that's quite a difference. Now I did run this test two or three times and they were always within about two minutes of each other, so I, I do believe it is broadly correct. I also ran exactly the same test on my i9 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro. And that unit finished the same conversion in 13 minutes and 11 seconds. So the performance of the 13 inch, even the i5, for processor intensive tasks is quite impressive, I think. It's certainly better than I was expecting. Let's move on. Let's have a look at video editing. Now I use Final Cut Pro for video editing, so let's get that fired up. There we go. Now this is a relatively simple project in this demo lab here. It is a 4K 30 frames per second video set from a Sony RX100. It's not that complex, there's not that much to it. I don't tend to use a lot of overlays, I don't tend to use a lot of colour correction. And if I just play back some of these clips, you can see exactly how smooth it is. It is surprisingly usable. I would be quite happy to edit my videos on this when I'm away travelling or on holiday, all that sort of stuff. Now what about export times? Well let's get this video exported. What we'll do is we'll export it to a 4K Apple TV format which is standard across uh, Final Cut Pro and we can compare it to my 16 inch MacBook Pro and also my iMac Pro. So let's do that. I'm going to select the Apple devices 4K. What I'll do is I'll just change the settings to make sure it's on better quality like that. There we go. So let's see how long this export actually takes. So as you can see here, the 13-inch MacBook Pro exported this in 14 minutes and 4 seconds, compared to the 16-inch MacBook Pro, which did it in 11 minutes and 20 seconds. Now the thing that might really surprise you is that my iMac Pro actually is slower than the 13-inch MacBook Pro at exporting video. It actually took 16 and a half minutes to export the same thing. Now that is common on my iMac Pro. I always found it slower than my 16-inch unit. And it surprised me a little bit that it's actually slower than the 13. Just to be clear, that's just exporting. Of course, on the iMac Pro, the thing to bear in mind is while I'm exporting, I can also have a couple of virtual machines running and be doing a ton of other things, things that you may struggle on these units as well. But I think you can see it is actually really usable and really quite impressive. I would be quite happy using this unit when I'm away doing my uh, video editing video editing behind let's move on and have a look at desktop virtualization so I have a Windows 10 machine set up here in parallels desktop let's have a look, quick look at the configuration so by default I've got four processors allocated and six gig of RAM it's really good that this machine has 16 gig of RAM as stock by the way I wouldn't normally order a machine with only 8 gig 
purely because I like to use virtual machines. So let's get this powered up and we'll see what the performance is like. There we go, and it's booted, didn't take any time at all. Let's get logged in. And there is our machine. So we'll have a quick look at Task Manager. You can see there that we've got our four virtual cores over one socket. We've got our six gig of allocated RAM and the machine is up and running in no time at all. So let's fire up our office applications and we'll see what the performance is like of those. I think I even have Vizio on this machine. Let me see. Yeah, there we go. So as you can see, the performance of this is excellent. Now, the other thing I've generally struggled on the lower powered machines is using things like coherence. So let me show you what I mean by coherence. So you can see at the moment, we're running our Windows 10 machine with a few Office apps running, and I'm running them in normal desktop mode. Now Parallels Desktop has this view called Coherence. So let me show you what it is. I'm gonna click on the view menu and just go to Enter Coherence. There we go. Now, as you can see, the Windows apps now appear as Windows in my main Mac OS environment. Now, this is the main way that I use Windows 10 under Parallels on my main iMac Pro and on my main MacBook Pro. It is very, very useful and it's very, very slick. I find it really usable. Now, I struggled using this mode on the, the older 13-inch MacBook Pro. Do you remember the old dual cores before they switched to quads? But on this machine, it is completely usable and very, very fluid. What about things like snapshots? Well, let's get this switch back to a window. Just exit coherence there. Let's see what snapshot performances are like. So I'm gonna to go to the menu, actions, take a snapshot. There we go, it's done. Now typically taking a snapshot is usually far faster than restoring it. And what I'm gonna do, just for the purposes of this demo, I'm just gonna remove Microsoft Office from this machine. I'm not gonna make you sit through that because it's really dull, but let me just remove it anyway. Okay, so we've got Office removed from this machine. So now if I try and fire up any of the Office apps like Word, it shouldn't be there. So let's have a look at the performance of restoring those snapshots, because typically that tends to be slower. So I'm gonna to go to Actions, gonna to revert to Snapshot. I'm not gonna save the current state. There we go. How fast is that? Now we should of course have Office and everything like that back on this machine. So as you can see, the performance of this is excellent. So let's get this machine shut down. And there we go, that's virtualization for you. I've been using this a fair bit today and I have to say the Windows 10, even in coherence mode, is perfectly usable. It feels like any other Windows 10 machine. In fact, it, it feels pretty much like I'm using my Dell XPS. So yeah, it works really, really well. Let's go and have a look at photo editing then. Now, much like everyone else, I tend to use Lightroom for my raw file editing. So let's fire that up. There we go. Now we have a folder here called A7R4. Now this is full of some raw files. Now what's interesting about those files is if I show you, they are from my Sony A7R Mark IV. And if you look at them, each one is 123 megabytes in size. So, so let's see if this laptop can handle these photos. Now I'm not gonna do much with them, but let's perhaps just choose the work first one. We'll do a couple of basic edits, perhaps stick it on auto and do some lens correction maybe. There we go. What I'm gonna do is just copy that 
set to every other photo in this set here. Now, of course, you wouldn't normally do this, but it will give you an idea of what the performance is like. And we're done now. But like I say, bear in mind, these are 123 megabyte raw files. So let's get them exported and see what the export time is like on all of these. So I'm going to export them. I want them at full size. 90% quality is about right. So I'm just going to export. So let's see how long it takes. Now, I think that's mighty impressive, especially considering the size of those raw files. If your raw files are a more reasonable size, so for example, I have a set here from my RX100, which I'm not sure how big they are. I think they're probably about 23 megabytes each or something like that. 20 megabytes, yeah. So if your raw files are more reasonable, then the performance of this is even better. So for example, if I just do some basic adjustments to this, And then we can copy it to all the other. I mean, there's more photos in this one. I think there's about 70 odd. Now, what's impressed me so much about the photo editing with this is that it manages those A7R RAW files. My 2020 13 inch XPS, if I give it the RAW files for my A7R, it just goes away and sulks for quite a while. The fact that it's so usable on this is really quite a surprise and I found it quite impressive. So I hope you found some of that useful. Now I haven't done the boot camp element. I ran out of time, I've actually got to start work. The other thing is, I'm gonna do a separate video on the boot camp piece anyway because I'm quite interested to see how well that performs and I'm hoping it's going to be a lot better than the 16 inch unit running Windows natively. But come back in a few days and I should have that video up. Now I've actually got one of the i7 units on order for my own machine. Having tested this i5 and seen how well it copes with the video and my photo editing, I'm questioning whether I actually need the i7. So I might have a think and perhaps cancel that one. The new keyboard's a bit of a bonus, I like that, but then I never really had an issue with the previous keyboard, but it does make me nervous knowing that so many of my machines had that previous keyboard, knowing all the problems that everybody had. Anyway, any questions on any of this stuff, drop me a comment below and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Keep an eye out for that bootcamp video, I think that could be quite interesting. Till next time.